Um, as it's eight o'clock. So good evening, everyone, and thank you very much for joining us uh, for tonight's webinar. Uh, as usual, this webinar uh, is recorded and it will be available to view again on our YouTube channel, East Society Group. There is CET available for tonight's lecture, and that's if you're an ophthalmic optician, uh, dispensing optician, and a contact lens optician. I'll upload the points towards the end of the week, uh, and the video will be on the YouTube channel towards the end of the week as well. The lecture will run for about an hour, uh, as usual, and there'll be time for questions at the end. At the bottom of the screen, there is a Q&A box, so if you have any questions, if you could type them into there, and at the end of the lecture, I'll then put the uh, questions to our guest speaker. So tonight, I would like to introduce our guest speaker, Mr Ian Edis. After finishing his medical school training in Italy, he then went on to complete his ophthalmic surgical training in Athens working at the University Pediatric Hospital and at the prestigious Red Cross Hospital of Athens. He moved to Wales to join the ophthalmology department at the Singleton Hospital in Swansea in 2011 and was there for two years before becoming part of the ophthalmology team in East Sussex in 2013. In order to expand his anterior segment experience, he completed two years of an honorary clinical attachment at the corneoplastic unit at the Queen Victoria Hospital in East Grinstead, alongside his job in East Sussex. Currently, he is a consultant ophthalmic a surgeon with a special interest in anterior segment conditions and medical retina, as well as being the ophthalmology clinical governance lead at East Sussex Healthcare NHS Trust. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome Mr. Ian Edis for tonight's lecture. Thank you. Hello all, can you hear me Ian? Uh, we can hear you, yes. Great. Hello everybody, thanks Ian for the invite and thanks everybody for uh, joining in today. Um, today we're gonna do a talk about uh, the management of anterior segment pathology in minor eye condition service. Um, in some areas, some topics, there are a little bit too many details, but I think they're important in order to know how to manage these conditions and actually how to explain some things to your patients that they come to your, to, to your practice. Um, let's see first what brings a patient to, to, to a practice. Um, there are three columns over there. As you understand, I'm going to uh, focus more on the anterior segment on the left side where we have a red painful eye. Um, so patients come into your service mainly due to this problem. Let's start with the most common thing. We're gonna go from uh, the anterior part of the eye, then going uh, towards the cornea, let's say. So we'll, let's start with the first pathology that the most common pathology when we, where we have very demanding patients together with dry eyes as well, uh, as I'm sure you already know. Let's start with the blepharitis. It's a family of inflammatory diseases of the eyelids, and it's likely to happen after the age of 50, but we have also much younger patients. We can divide it in anterior blepharitis, which is an inflammation mainly centered around the skin, the eyelashes and the last follicles, and posterior blepharitis, which involves the meibomian gland orifices and the meibomian glands. There is a considerable overlap in these processes in individual patients, so they might have actually both. It's often um, associated with systemic diseases like rosacea, atopy, and seborrheic dermatitis, and other ocular diseases such as dry eye, chalazion, trochiasis, entropion, and entropion, and also with infectious and other inflammatory conjunctivitis and keratitis. So as you see, it's it's not does involve only the leads. The, now, what are the symptoms of blepharitis? It's a, they have a chronic course with intermittent exacerbations and eruptions of symptomatic disease. So sometimes my patients have these flare-ups, as we call them. Uh, they, they present to you with itchy, sore, and red eyelids that stick together. They have crusty or greasy eyelashes, burning, gritty sensation, watering, increased sensitivity to light. Sometimes they might have these swollen eyelid, swollen eyelid margins and uh, they're finding their contact lenses uncomfortable to wear. 
finally, we have abnormal uh, growth of the eyelashes and loss of the eyelashes in severe cases. Then uh, heat, cold, and alcohol, and spicy food intolerance, depending on what they eat, they must have exacerbations of these symptoms. What are the signs of blepharitis? Um, the gross examination of the eyelids shows this redness, erythema, encrusting of the lashes and the lid margins. Practically, we have crusting of the lashes and uh, meibomian orifices. We have uh, eyelid margin ulcers. We have uh, plugging and pouting of the meibomian orifices. Telangiectasias of the lid margin. Practically, when you notice the lid margin, uh, you see small, tiny blood vessels. Finally, we have loss of eyelashes, which is called madarosis, and whitening of the eyelashes, uh, which is called polyosis. And in the end, we have a scarring procedure. So we have um, lead scarring and misdirection of the eyelashes, which is trachiasis. What are the congenital uh, findings? We have injected eyes, papillary injection. We have uh, cases with advanced uh, tarsal thickening. We have loss of the normal uh, vasculature of the tarsus. And uh, finally, they start to develop fibrosis, scarring tissue, and congenital scarring. And in the end, uh, they might develop a cicatricial contraction and subse subsequent entropion. The corneal findings from uh, the blepharitis are punctate epithelial erosions, erosions marginal infiltrates, then eventually ulcers, marginal ulcers, limbal, limbal inflammation and thickening, that is limbitis, peripheral corneal ectasia in rare cases, we might have a, a corneal panus and flectenal formation due to staphylococcal infections, and the corneal involvement occurs mostly commonly in other positions where the limbus is crossed by the upper and lower lid margins at the tw um, second, fourth, eighth, and, and 10 clock positions. The corneal infiltrates can progress to infection and even perforation. So now the anterior blepharitis involves mainly the lashes and is, uh, is associated with non bombian uh, oil glands. We have crusting uh, that refers to flakes of material that adhere to the eyelashes and usually represents seborrheic disease. Then we have a collarate, which is an irregular ring-like formation around the eyelash uh, shaft that occurs with staphylococcal disease. And staphylococcal blepharitis is um, typified by this formation of the small collarates on the eyelashes. When we have a sleeve, which is a smooth, like a tube-like, uh, of material that also surrounds the base of the eyelashes. Uh, this is associated with an infection of the um, parasite. It's called Demodex. Probably you might already heard about it. Eventually, you might see ulcers at the base of the eyelashes, and these are covered with a crust of fibrin. And uh, finally, in cases of seborrheic blepharitis, that involves primarily the anterior lid and is associated with the formation of greased, greasy crusts of material which is adherent to the eyelash shaft. On the posterior blepharitis, then we have alterations in the secretory metabolism and function that leads to disease of the meibomian glands. The meibomian secretions become more wax-like and they begin to block the gland orifices. This material becomes a growth medium for bacteria and they can seep in the deeper eyelid tissues causing inflammation and then eventually uh, the formation with chordeola, styes, or chalasions. The causes of blepharitis now. Most common cause is rosacea, which is a skin condition. Might have a herpes simplex dermatitis, varicella dermatitis, molluscum contagiosum, um, which is a responsible pox virus is responsible for that. Allergic or contact dermatitis, seborrheic dermatitis, staphylococcal dermatitis, and parasitic infections like Demodex. So how do we do um, a workup with, um, for these patients? Uh, some of these things are not available widely. 
but they help with the diagnosis and the management. Testing the patients for, with blepharitis for tenuous efficiency or nasolacrimal uh, drainage problems, obstruction, is appropriate because they can be associated with blepharitis. Uh, I don't know how many of you are familiar with the tear lab uh, osmolarity test, which is very good at um, um, helping with knowing the osmolarity of the, of the tears uh, in order to quantify and be able to say uh, if it's uh, dry eye or non-dry eye. And then regarding the imaging of the meibomian glands, we have the lipid view, which allows visualization of each individual gland in the inverted inferior tarsal plate. And this uh, permits a quantitative analysis of the meibomian gland viability, especially in severe cases. Similar images we can get from the meibomian glands can be obtained with a keratograph 5M from Oculus. This is the images where you can actually see the meibomian glands. So what is the workup uh, regarding a patient that has blepharitis? Further questions to ask, you know, the more the questions we ask to our patients, the more we identify what is the problem and they, we can help them. So is there a systemic condition such as rosacea or lupus that has become active? Are the joints achy? Uh, how are they general feeling? Or where are you on your menstrual cycle? That's important because uh, estrogen promotes inflammation. Is it something that the patient did? Did you see cosmetics or just get your nails or your hair done? Did you start a new medication? Um, that's Roaccutane as a tretinoin or antidepressants, Parkinson's, antihistamines, birth control pills, and HRT. They all affect that. Uh, or is it the environment? Have you started a new job or moved in a new place? Have you taken up a new hobby such as painting? So these are questions to ask uh, in order to find out what is the um, irritating factor. Treatment. Now, the treatment, as you already know, it's not a cure, but it's a process. I advise, strongly advise, with application of heat and uh, to warm the, the eyelid glands, secretions. This brings the, the content in its melting point and the results in liquef liquefaction, and it promotes uh, evacuation and cleaning of the secretory passages. So you have the heat masks like eye bags, uh, or patients can use soak, uh, soaked uh, warm compresses with uh, warm water, or um, there are already many useful eyelid applicators are readily available and uh, they provide more sterile application surface instead of using cotton wool um, buds and stuff like that. Um, we continue with mechanical washing off of the eyelid margins to remove the anterior material such as scarf, collarettes, and crusting, as we described earlier, and to clean the gland orifices. Um, you, this can be done with a warm washcloth or with cotton tip applicators or gauze pads. Some clinicians instruct patients to use a baby oil a shampoo with warm water and to form a clinic solution. This is something I don't usually um, advise my patients because there are some patients who develop uh, some kind of allergies or irritation and there are already commercially available cleaning preparations for that. So it's a thing that I don't personally advise. And definitely preservative-free lubricating drops and ointments to treat the associated uh, dry eye. Now, an honorable mention regarding the omega-3 um, supplements. Up until 2018, 2017, 18, I actually used to advise my patients to use omega-3 supplements, flaxseed oil, for example, um, capsules twice a day um, for the management of uh, blepharitis. Um, many patients actually came back saying that they achieved some kind of benefit uh, from that. Then uh, in 2018, there was a study from uh, in America. Uh, it's the dry eye assessment and management study that uh, concluded that omega-3 supplements from fish soil supplements, they're not better than placebo for dry eye. And they had strong evidence to back this up. So from this point on, from that point on, I don't regularly advise my patients to uh, use omega-3 supplements for their eyes they, or to manage their blepharitis or dry eye. They can use it for other um, reasons, 
but I don't specifically do that because as you know uh, very well, or all, all our patients are very well informed, they go online, so uh, they, they do the research. So I wouldn't advise something that eventually the patient might see that and say, come back to you, oh, you advise me something that is not recommended. So I tend not to tell them that they can use it, but definitely it's something that on my, usually talk to my patients that have severe blepharitis is something that I tell them that if they would like to explore it, they can, but it's not something that I personally recommend. The treatment, if you tried all that, then you refer these patients to us, to the hospital. We start with topical antibiotics and antibiotic uh, and steroid creams for short course period of time. And uh, we also might start topical steroid treatment with a brief course of topical drops, such as FML or hydrocortisone, that we soft accord. It's a preservative free and low uh, strength um, steroid, very good as well. And we quickly taper them down as the inflammation improves. And in more severe cases, we use oral antibiotics like um, doxycycline for a course of period of time that can last up to six months sometimes. That is, though it's contraindicated in pregnancy in children younger, younger than eight years. As an alternative, we have um, azithromycin, which is a macrolide. It's another antibiotic. It's a pulsed um, treatment, practically uh, 500 milligrams per day for three days in three cycles with seven day intervals. So practically the treatment is, uh, they start on a Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, then four days they're off, and then they start again next week, and that's for three weeks. It's usually very effective. Now, an honorable mention, <coughs> sorry, to Demodex. It may be overlooked by clinicians many times, and uh, recent uh, research points to a strong correlation between levels of Demodex and the severity of Bevaritis. More in eight, more than eight, uh, in 10 people over the age of 60 are infested with Demodex, but some are troubled by the presence of Demodex mites, while others <coughs> sorry, have no symptoms. On average, mites take a three-week uh, lifespan, so lead hygiene is critical for interrupting their life uh, circle. Very effective for Demodex, it's a tea tree oil. This acts like, again, bacteria, fungus, mites, and inflammation. Um, all of which they might be involved in some point, uh, in some form in blepharitis, and it's very effective in Demodex. Practically, you can find these uh, ready uh, wipes like Liradex and Optase, um, they have been uh, used quite widely with good results. But it's very important that when you suspect Demodex to instruct your patients to uh, follow the strict regime of, clean, of lead hygiene for a long period of time, because as we discussed, they have like a three week circle. Other therapies that are used um, for blepharitis um, with very good results, uh, I'm afraid I don't have a personal uh, experience, but it's uh, reading all the studies and seeing photographs, it's, they're quite effective. Uh, like Intel's past light, especially in severe cases of uh, blepharitis, this uses light therapy and uh, practically it acts like a heat lamp. And actually what it does, it liquefies the content of the meibomian glands. And uh, what it also does due to the fact that it's uh, li this light, it uh, occludes the small tiny blood vessels when we have on the lead margin, the teleinjectatic blood vessels and these cause less inflammation. So it is known that this working from that point of view because it reduces all the inflammatory factors. Then uh, we, more than one circle might be of treatment might be required. Usually I've read three or four might be required, but usually patients say that after the first treatment, they have very good results. Then we have the Blefex, which it's, it's a spinning mechanism practically that spins a medical grade micro sponge along the edge of the leads and the eyelashes, removing the scars and the debris and practically does exfoliation of the eyelids. And finally, it's, there's another thing it's called with thermal pulsation or lipi flow, which is a device that provides heat and expresses the lacrimal gland similar to the combined action of 
blinking and warm compressors. So the, the main function of, of all these treatments, therapies, is to try to liquefy the content of the meibomian glands. So um, continue with dry eyes. It's, uh, that's our next topic practically. It's a multi multifactorial disease of the tears and the ocular surface that results in discomfort, visual disturbance, tear filling instability with potential damage to the ocular surface. The ocular surface is an integrated anatomical unit with all these apparatus that they all work together. So it's not one thing that is the problem, it's a combined, um, um, it's a combination of things that happen that a patient complains about dry eyes. First of all, what we have, the, the tear film is, uh, has three components. The superficial thin lipid layer, a middle thick aqueous layer, and the innermost hydrophilic mucin layer. We have dry eye uh, associated with Sjogren's, which is an autoimmune disease, and we have dry eye disease non-associated with uh, Sjogren's. This can also be subdivided in pure aqueous deficiency, so reduced production of tears, and of ev evaporative dry eye. 86% of patients with dry eye disease also have signs of meibomian gland dysfunction. The signs and symptoms, oh, you all know about that. Foreign body sensation, ocular dryness, gritty eyes, injected eyes, hyperemia, mucus, ocular irritation generally, excessive tearing, because this is secondary to reflex secretion. Many patients, when you tell them you have dry eyes, they complain, oh, but my eyes are watering. And you have to explain them this is a reflex secretion due to the brain saying to the lacrimal gland, produce more tears to comp compensate. Then photophobia, light sensitivity, and fluctuating and blurry or blurry vision. The diagnosis of a dry eye, it's a staining of the cornea and the conjunctival epithelium with many flourishing. This is usually what you find in your practice. If you have available the, the tear film osmolarity, or there's another test, uh, ocular surface matrix metalloproteinase, this is uh, called inflammadry. Um, it gives you the level of uh, this uh, protein, which is very, very high in um, um, dry eye disease. The measurement of the tear breakup time and serum test, we have serum test uh, with uh, anesthetic or without anesthetic, checking and the tear meniscus height and quantification of tear, fill, tear components through analysis of tear proteins as well. This is more specific hospital for the hospitals and impression cytology to monitor progression of uh, ocular surface changes. And all this, before you start to see a patient, you can always apply the ocular surface disease index questionnaire. Treatment wise, this is a very difficult uh, topic. Um, I'm actually thinking about it. My most demanding patients are patients with blepharitis and dry eye disease because it's hard for them to understand that it's an ongoing process. Um, when you have a patient with cat that has cataract or they have problems in the retina, you tell them this is the treatment, this is what we're going to try to do. If we do your cataract surgery, you're going to be able to see fine. If you have macular edema for macular degeneration, we're going to do the injections, we're going to try to stabilize the condition. But the most demanding patients I find out is patients with uh, blepharitis and, and dry eye. Um, you have to instruct them and tell them that it's an ongoing process and um, they're going to have some periods of flare up and periods that are going to be feel better. We usually start with artificial tear uh, substitutes, preservative free, gels, ointments. In cases where uh, they're not that effective, then we continue with uh, topical steroids. And in uh, severe inflammation, then we use topical cyclosporin, which is a, an immunomodulator. Instead of using uh, topical steroids for a long period of time, we can use this uh, very strong anti-inflammatory drops like cyclosporin. Sometimes, as mentioned earlier, we use uh, topical uh, antibiotics. And in a few cases, um, before, in the past, autologous serum was widely used. 
it was taken from the blood and uh, from our blood and uh, got some drops that they were very effective because it has they have some uh, factors that uh, protect uh, the cornea then in more severe cases we use systemic immunosuppressants and like surgical treatment for that we can use pontal plugs or cauterization but we have to uh, know what we're treating because if you have a patient with severe inflammation of the lids you wouldn't put pantha plugs or cauterization because otherwise when you keep all the inflammatory components onto the eye and the case becomes more severe. Now we're going to a different topic, much easier, uh, patients that have a sty or medically known as hordeolum or chalasium. So the chalasium, it's a firm lesion. It's a non-tender nodular lesion of the eyelid resulting from obstruction and subsequent chronic uh, granulomatous inflammation of a zeiss or a meibomian gland. It can be subacute or chronic, and this is what differentiates it from a sty, and generally less painful lesion. They might first present with a swelling and redness, and eventually they evolve in a painless rubbery nodular lesion. They can cause swelling, red, uh, tenderness, sometimes sensitivity to light or increased tearing and heaviness of the eyelid depending on the position. Um, very large chalasia can exert pressure on the cornea leading to astigmatism. And this is very important if you have a child because there have been mentioned uh, cases where uh, they might have developed amblyopia due to a long-standing chalasia. And finally, a uh, collision might be mistaken by a sty, but it can be differentiated, but it's from its subacute to chronic onset, slower growth and relative non tenderness and the location on the inner eyelid. The treatment of a collision is uh, not, it's, it's with warm compressors and antibiotic, it's not indicated because it's not an infection. Lots of warm, comp warm compressors, five, 10 minutes, three, six times a day, Usually patients do it once or twice a day. The referral to us to an ophthalmologist is for surgical incision uh, when they have tried uh, all the, with warm compressors or it's recurrent and persistently uh, symptomatic. Instead, the hordelum, the sty, it's something acute, purulent inflammation of the glands of the eyelash follicles of the eyelid. It's um, usually the pathogen responsible is the Staphylococcus aureus which gains access to the meibomian glands uh, or eyelashes, uh, leading to an acute, poor, and painful inflammation of the eyelid. They begin, they begin like, like small red bumps with yellow spots at the center. And um, usually they can be, um, they can cause localized swelling, pain, tenderness, redness, and crossing of the eyelid margins. They can be differentiated from the chalasian, but they, because they are acute, fast growth, and very tender. And the location is just on the lead margin. The treatment, again, warm, warm compresses can assist with drainage and resolution of these lesions. The antibiotics like chlorophemical ointment or fusithalmic are more indicated in the initial phase because when they become chronic, they might harden and develop into chalasians. Now we're going to a different uh, area of, uh, of the eye. I'm going to talk about um, conjunctivitis, which we can divide in three main um, causes from bacterial, viral, and allergic. Don't worry, I'm not going to talk about all this. First of all, we need to find out, again, it's all about asking the right um, questions to our patients to uh, be able to see what is the main cause and the problem. Of course, we take into consideration age, occupation, social habits, the brief history of any systemic disease, history of any recent exposure to other cases is extremely painful, especially to children, like a common adenoviral conjunctivitis. And medication history is important to document because, and what has been already tried to rule out any um, medication-induced conjunctivitis and other drug-related causes, use of contact lens wear, especially extended contact lens use, uh, 
And then patients with typical bacterial conjunctivitis, they don't complain about light sensitivity. The sensitivity to light is a symptom of inflammation, like an aritis, or a disturbance in the corneal epithelium with lesions that test positive on flourishing. Um, duration of the disease, and, uh, and then asking about the duration of the disease and previous attempts at uh, any therapy. So we have, we're dividing the um, conjunctivitis in gram positive and gram negative bacteria. But if you think about it, only 30% of primary care patients with infectious conjunctivitis are confirmed to have bacterial conjunctivitis. And although 80% are treated with antibiotics, because most of the times we say, try this chloramphenicol, it's going to be all right. So, for uh, the bacterial conjunctivitis, the conjunctival injection might be present um, segmentally or diffusely. Um, I'm sure you already know about the distinction about follicles and papilla. I'm not going to go into these details. But for the bacterial conjunctivitis, the discharge is typically more purulent than the watery discharge that we find in viral or allergic conjunctivitis. This uh, discharge can appear white, yellow, or even greenish in color. The swelling of the eyelids is often present, but it's mild in most cases of bacterial conjunctivitis. Severe edema, swelling, in the presence of, of uh, mucus of permanent discharge, raises the suspicion of Neisseria gonorrhea infection, which is a, a sexually transmitted disease. Treatment for bacterial conjunctivitis, they are self-limiting. Although topical antibiotics are recommended because they can shorten the duration of the disease and prevent the spread of infection. For mild and non-vision threatening bacterial conjunctivitis, older generation antibiotics can be used like chromphemical. Uh, if suspicion of chlamydia or neisseria, it's better to uh, refer to the hospital. Now, Let's talk about another category of the conjunctivitis, uh, viral conjunctivitis. They are typically caused by adenovirus or herpes cyclus simplex virus, varicella virus, other small virus like pig coronavirus that cause this acute hemorrhagic conjunctivitis, pox virus like molluscum contagiosum or vaccinia, and also coronavirus. Uh, the coronavirus is um, uh, is known to cause conjunctivitis, but on a later stage uh, of the disease. Um, so this is something that we already are aware of. And um, bear in mind as well, though, that the conjunctiva can be a point of entry of the coronavirus. So if a patient coughs or, I don't know, sneezes and you're around, you can actually get it from a contact, possible contact from the conjunctiva. The viral conjunctivitis is highly contagious, generally, usually for 10, 12 days from the onset, as long as the eyes are red. Patients should avoid touching their uh, eyes, shaking hands, sharing towels, napkins, pillowcases, and other fomites, along uh, other activities. They have itchy eyes, there's excessive watering, redness, discharge. Sometimes, I've seen it in children many times, they cause these membranes, pseudomembranes that can actually peel them off. And they have this light sensitivity, especially when there is corneal involvement. The treatment for adenoviral conjunctivitis is supportive. Patients should be instructed to use cold compresses and lubricants, such as chilled artificial tears for comfort. I usually advise them to have some lubricating drops in the fridge. It works quite well. And patients with conjunctivitis caused by herpes simplex um, usually are treated with uh, topical antiviral agents, including uh, gancyclovir. The treatment with uh, varicella zoster disease includes high dose oral acyclovir to terminate the viral uh, replication. Sometimes you might get patients in your practice that uh, they had a previous conjunctivitis or viral conjunctivitis and they come to you with uh, the symptom of, oh, I've noticed some blurry vision for some time. You can um, see these white, small subepithelial uh, infiltrates that can develop one to two weeks later uh, 
than uh, from the onset of the viral conjunctivitis, and they can actually persist for years. There have been uh, cases in literature that they can last up to two years, and they can cause reduction in the visual acuity. Um, I do remember as a registrar on the on the pediatric hospital, actually one of my colleagues got a viral conjunctivitis with subepithelial lymphocytes, and his refraction has changed quite a lot, but after six months, everything resolved. The treatment with topical steroids is not recommended, but if there are a lot and they are on the visual axis, uh, you can use fluoromethylone, FML, or softacord can be used, but there's not any uh, strong evidence in the literature that they, that, that they, they actually help. Another category of uh, allergic, of conjunctivitis is the allergic conjunctivitis, which can be seasonal and perennial uh, allergic conjunctivitis. We have the vernal keratoconjunctivitis, that means when it involves the cornea, the atopic keratoconjunctivitis, and giant papillary conjunctivitis. This is a, is, a, is a category of seasonal and perennial allergic conjunctivitis. The same allergens that trigger allergic rhinitis and hay fever may be involved in the pathogenesis of allergic conjunctivitis. Dust, molds, Pollen, grass, and weeds um, are also responsible. Symptoms, we got ocular itching, redness, burning, and excessive uh, tearing. The treatment is to avoid the offending antigen, is the primary thing that we need to do. Um, Preservative-free ocular lubricants, topical antihistamines, mast cell subilite, stabilizers. Uh, I prefer to use and have good results with opatanol, but it's not, there's not any preservative-free formulation. Um, sodium chromoglycate is an alternative. Uh, the only preservative-free formulation is uh, catachrom, um, and I do use it mainly in children uh, because uh, children who, has, who have um, uh, vernal ker keratoconjunctivitis uh, would complain with lots of itchiness, I found that catachrom, which is a uh, preservative-free sodium chromoglycate for long-term use, it's actually quite good. Uh, in a few cases, we can use uh, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory medications and steroids mainly on the initial onset for mainly for comfort. For the first couple of weeks, you can use a mild steroid like Softacort uh, or Prendizolone 0.5% following by uh, an anti-allergic, which can be of your preference, which can be opatanol or sodium uh, chromoglycate. Now finishing this uh, part of uh, the conjunctivitis, I, I tried not to go into many details that you wouldn't actually make any benefit, at least in your everyday practice. And just a, a plain slide about the subconjunctival hemorrhage. We have lots of patients coming or in a &E, uh, or from some referrals from, uh, from um, optometrist practices, because the patients oh, that they have it for the first time are very uh, worried about what's happening and how, and they worried about some, their vision mainly. First of all, reassure your patients and tell them to try to ignore the first one. Um, if they are recurrent episodes, if they, tell, if they tell you that they have these episodes a few times in a few months, uh, tell them that they need to go to their GP and check their blood pressure uh, or refer them back to their GP for, to do some blood test. And especially ask if the patient is on any, uh, any, is on any blood thinners, anticoagulants, warfarin or pixaban or aspirin. And uh, the thing that you can do for them is advise them uh, ocular lubricants in case they feel this uh, any irritation, but generally try to reassure them. Now, um, I'm gonna talk about um, the recurrent corneal epithelial erosion syndrome. It's a common clinical disorder that involves the corneal epithelium and epithelial basement membrane. It's a characterized by the repeat breakdown of the epithelium. Um, practically, it causes uh, moderate to severe pain, um, light sensitivity, tearing, and eventually it can lead to corneal scarring. So these are patients that they come to you and uh, they refer 
that they wake up at night that when they open their eyes um, with severe pain. And after one or two days, it gets better. Mm. And they have these repeat episodes. And sometimes this can develop scarring and can cause long-term problems with the vision. So the reason for that might be a previous trauma. So they might have a previous abrasion or something that's very common, like a paper cut. Uh, they had a piece of paper that went to their eye and uh, then they developed this continuous uh, recurrent epithelial erosion syndrome. Uh, or they might have um, something that we call epithelial basement membrane dystrophy, the MAP dot dystrophy, that it's um, uh, one of the corneal dystrophies that practically the outer layer of the cornea is not very well adherent to the inner layer of the cornea. So when there is a disruption due to a previous trauma or an abrasion, the cornea doesn't heal properly and uh, it's not very well attached. So at night mainly when our eyes are not lubricated, and also when we dream, we have something that we call REM and practically the eye moves under the eyelid. So causes small abrasions on the, on the eye, uh, on the cornea. So patients might open their eyes or wake up with severe pain. Another condition that it's, belongs in the spectrum of the MAP dot dystrophies is microcystic corneal dystrophy. So when you get a patient who describes these symptoms, don't expect all the times to see a map dot dystrophy or the classic map dot, map dot dystrophy. They might have a very nice clear cornea, but where you notice that there is a disruption in the epithelium, they have these tiny, tiny, small cystic lesions. So this is a, a variation of the map dot dystrophy or Kogan dystrophy, and uh, then it might affect only one eye. So just be very careful, or you can check the other eye to see if they have this condition. It's, it's a very subtle um, dystrophy, so you have to look for it, otherwise it might, uh, you might not notice it. Then we have the combination of a previous trauma and an epithelial uh, membrane dystrophy. As I mentioned earlier, a patient with has already a map dot dystrophy, they have a small abrasion, then it doesn't heal properly, and uh, they get these recurrent erosions. The treatment in the beginning, we start with uh, preservative-free lubricating drops um, and an ointment at night, a thick ointment like Vitae Pos or Lacrylube or Xylenite or Hylonite. Uh, this is very effective in the beginning. Some of the patients that I treated, they didn't come back with any problems, but um, if they come back uh, complaining about um, repeated problems uh, and non-resolving condition, then uh, when you have extensive um, disruption of the corneal epithelium, you need to give them antibiotics, chromophemical and pain, pain relievers. Uh, sometimes you can have to put a big bandage contact lens if there's a big uh, flap uh, from the abrasion. Sometimes you can give some steroid drops or um, doxycycline to treat also um, any problems with uh, blepharitis. In a few cases, um, as first line treatment, we can do something that's called anterior stromal micropuncture. This is actually by using a needle, a plain needle that's done on the slit lamp. You do some tiny micropunctures on the cornea uh, to, and then you place a bandage contact lens by doing this, you try to promote healing and you try to facilitate the healing of the inner layers of the cornea. Sometimes it's effective. I've done it in a few patients and it was quite effective. In other patients, it was not that good. So um, I had to refer them for laser treatment. It's called PTK. It's phototherapeutic keratectomy. It's a very uh, fine abl ablation around 10 micro microns um, and it's very effective actually in cases with the recurrent corneal erosion syndrome. Usually this is done when the affected area is on the visual axis otherwise it's not justified and I'm afraid there are not many um, centers that they have uh, the laser uh, available. Then another category of um, uh, 
diseases is the herpes simplex keratitis um, the, with the classic uh, appearance of the dendrites, but it's not always like that, I'm afraid. The ocular uh, herpetic infection can manifest as blepharoconjunctivitis, so it affects the lids as well. Keratitis, the cornea, iridocyclitis is when we have an inflammation, and finally, acute retinal necrosis. So practically, when we have a patient with herpes keratitis, it cannot, it doesn't involve only the cornea, I'm afraid. We, it can involve all the aspects and the layers of the eye. Um, the most common form, though, is the epithelial keratitis that accounts to 50 to 8% of ocular herpes. The treatment for the um, epithelial um, keratitis, which is the one that you might probably see, is with uh, acyclovir, which is not, I'm afraid, available. So we use topical, um, acyclovir, uh, topical gun cyclovir, virgan, five times a day. It's very important when you see a patient like that in your practice to notice if you notice if there is any anterior chamber inflammation, because then we go to the aspect of um, uh, herpetic keratouveitis. This is when we need to give them also some oral um, antiviral treatment for long term to prevent uh, further, um, further episodes and worsening of their condition because there's also an inflammation into the eye. Then uh, an aspect of uh, other bacterial uh, infections of the cornea. This is a simple tab that shows all the pathogens or the most common pathogens uh, responsible for uh, corneal infections. We've got Staphylococcus, Streptococcus, Pseudomonas, Moxarella, Nocardia, other typical bacteria. Um, you see here when on, on the on the on the tab where we mostly find them. Uh, contact lens, Pseudomonas, very very common as well. This is an example of a Pseudomonas keratitis. Um, actually, we had in the hospital in this period of time, in the past like three, four months, three patients with Pseudomonas. It's, uh, it's rapidly spreading in, from the fact that from the time that the patient has uh, uh, contacted the um, infection, it can go, um, it can extend very fast and it ends in the periphery and it's very deep within 24 hours. So within a couple of days, uh, the patients can come to you with a clinical picture like this photograph, for example. So it doesn't take long to uh, come in this situation. Uh, it spreads uh, concentr concentrically and it forms like a ring-like uh, ulcer. And sometimes you can see also hypopion. And if, it does, if it's not treated, it's caused, it causes corneal uh, melting. Finally, uh, we've got another category, fungus, fung fungal infections. I'm not going to go into details with that. It's more hospital um, uh, related conditions. Uh, but if you see patients with an ulcer, the first thing you need to do is refer them to the hospital. I'm quite sure that everybody does that. For the fungal keratitis, again, it's very important as all patients, the history, risk factors, if they use contact lenses, if they have any previous ocular surface disease, any trauma, if they were gardening, anything like that, any previous use of steroids or long-term steroid uh, use drops, uh, antibiotics or any problems with the atmosphere. I do remember I had a patient who was walking on the seafront. She had something went into her eye and uh, she came in the hospital for the first week. She was treated with uh, strong antibiotics like um, ofloxacin, uh, and then we changed that to other antibiotics. There was not any improvement. Even though we did some scrapes, we didn't find any uh, uh, pathogen uh, responsible for that. And the clinical picture was not getting better. The patient was getting worse. So we started with some um, drops, uh, antifungal drops, and after a week, there was a big difference. As I, as I said earlier, this is something that we usually see in the hospital. Um, we use uh, medications that are not widely available, like lactamycin and amphotericin, and sometimes we use also some uh, oral uh, medication as well. 
Now I'm going to talk regarding some another condition that uh, it's very important uh, for you to be aware of or alert. Um, Acanthamoeba keratitis. This is a parasite that exists in two forms, uh, the trophozoite and the cyst. It's very resistant. Um, they are commonly found, they're free living uh, parasites, amoebas, that they've been located in various environments, including pools, hot tubs, tub water, shower water, and contact lens solution. They're very resistant, and when they're not in favorable conditions, they can become cysts, and they're very, very hard to treat. A definite sign is that they develop these uh, perineural infiltrates. Uh, you know, the cornea has many nerve endings, and one of the characteristic signs is that you see these uh, infiltrates along the nerves. The um, definite diagnosis, because it's very difficult even to take scrapes because they're very deep. So even with the corneal scrapes, you're not able to have a, def a, a, a definite diagnosis, is to uh, do something that we call confocal microscopy. It's something that is not widely available. Here south, uh, only uh, East Grinstead has uh, confocal microscopy or London in Moorfields. And um, I have to say that I usually have like two or three cases a year with acatamoeba keratitis. So it's very important uh, for you guys to be alert and ask the patients, especially if you use contact lenses, if they have uh, done any swimming, showering, sleeping or gardening with contact lenses. Uh, if they develop any ulcer, you have to be very alert and refer them to the hospital right away. They're very difficult to treat and also getting the medication uh, because we don't have them readily available. Um, this is what we use. This is actually something that cleaning for the pools. It's a PHMB, polyhexanide, and um, intensive drops with polyhexanide or chlorhexidine. Uh, Brolin is another um, way to treat these infections. Um, Brolin is very easy to find and actually had a couple of patients that I started treatment right away with Brolin and then it took one or two days to get chlorhexidine or PHMB. So the, if we manage to treat them very early, we have very good, uh, very good results. For pain relief, we give uh, oral non-steroid uh, agents. And in severe cases, we do have to give immunosuppression if they the sclera is involved. Now, this is something from the Royal College of Pharmacologists. It's, it's um, mainly, or was mainly addressed to ophthalmologists, but it's something that I think that everybody needs to know, that acanthamoeba infection should be considered in all cases of epithelial or anterior stromal keratitis in patients who have worn cosmetic contact lenses don't make a diagnosis of herpes simplex infection in a contact lens wearer until a canthamoeba infection has been excluded. And I think that's the only uh, takeaway message from this point of view when you have patients come into your practice with um, a contact lens related ulcer, or they might come to you saying, oh, I was wearing contact lenses two, three days ago, and they, it might appear like a herpetic infection. So it's best, it's best to refer. Now I'm gonna totally change uh, the topic and I'm gonna talk about something that it's, um, I'm doing a special clinic regarding that. It's uh, keratoconus, which is a non-inflammatory eye condition, which the normal um, dome-shaped clear window of the eye, the cornea, progressively thinks and becomes like a cone-shaped, um, rugby-shaped shape, ball shape. Um, the etiology is unknown, the reason is unknown. However, it's associated with allergy, atopy, Down syndrome, or patients with Ehlers, Danlos, or connective tissue disorders. The hereditary pattern, pattern it's uh, neither prominent or predictable, but we have positive family history. The incidence of keratoconus is often around to be one to in 2000. The risk factors is eye rubbing associated with atopy and vernal keratoconjunctivitis, sleep apnea, connective tissue disorders, floppy eyelid syndrome, retinitis pigmentosa, a positive family history, so a member of family who has it already, and Down syndrome. 
what do you see in these patients? Uh, so you got an asymmetric refractive error with high or progressive change in the astigmatism. And the keratometry shows high astigmatism and irregularity. You got the seizuring of the red reflex in retinoscopy. And then you have inferior stiffening and change in the K values. Um, you have cornea thinning, especially the inferior cornea. And, um, and you get to see in some cases, this something that we call flacering, it's iron deposit. It's often present within the epithelium around the base of the cone. It's a brown in color and you can actually see it better with a cobalt blue filter. And in more severe cases, you can see something that we call voct stria, which are fine vertically parallel stri on the, on the stroma. Um, and this generally disappear with firm pressure over the eyeball and they reappear again when the pressure is discontinued. This is an image of a pentacam. The, in all patients that they come with a suspicion of keratoconus, pentacam is a golden standard for the diagnosis of keratoconus. Um, this is a young patient. Uh, this is the image from the right eye. On the top left of your screen, uh, we have, you can see this, the, the irregular uh, astigmatism that there is. Um, imagine that as an hourglass, but you can see it's not symmetric. I usually tell to my patients, imagine the blue as a, as a, as a sea, the, um, the green as a valley, and this orange, yellow, orange area like a hill. So they understand that there is this bulginess of the cornea. On this map here, you can see that there is an, a front elevation of the cornea, so it's bulging a little bit. On the map underneath, you can see that the inner part of the cornea has uh, this elevation. And the corneal thickness map, the one down left, uh, you can see that there is a thinning paracentral, uh, inferior to the center of the cornea. And uh, this is a mild keratoconus. The other eye from the same patient has a more advanced keratoconus. As you see, uh, this area is more prominent, it's more red. You can see it's bulging practically. Uh, the elevation front is 88 microns, so, and the back elevation is 136. And the inferior uh, thickening, and the, sorry, and the thickening of the cornea, inferiorly, it's, it, it's very thin. Um, so this patient does not, um, is not a candidate for corneal cross-linking, which is uh, known to stop the progression of keratoconus. This patient uh, needs a corneal graft, actually. Treatment for keratoconus is with corneal collagen cross-linking, in, invented by Theo Siller in 1997, but it started to have a clinical application in 1998. Uh, practically, it's uh, riboflavin, vitamin B2 drops, and ultraviolet light. It's a procedure that lasts, the protocol that lasts half an hour. Uh, we scrape the surface of the cornea. There are other methods as well now, uh, nowadays that they don't scrape the surface of the cornea, but they, they're not as effective as the protocol that was invented by Theo Schiller. So scraping the surface of the cornea, applying these uh, drops, and, and then ultraviolet light. What it does, it stiffens the cornea and um, it stops the progression. Um, and when you have a patient with a suspicion of keratoconus, or a change in the astigmatism, or a patient who has already keratoconus, but they have children, it's best to refer them because it's a pity not to be able to offer to them uh, cross-linking to stabilize the procedure in order for them to avoid um, a corneal graft. Because I, don't, I personally don't think that nowadays that cross-linking is widely available, that these patients uh, need to have uh, a corneal graft in order to uh, have a, a good quality of life. In the beginning, you might treat them with spectacles or soft toric contact lenses in very mild cases, and then eventually uh, rigid gas permeable contact lenses. In other conditions, more severe conditions, semi-scleral contact lenses, piggyback lenses, scleral lenses, or hybrid lenses. And when they become contact lens intolerant or they don't have an acceptable vision, from scarring, because they might develop scarring, then we proceed to surgical uh, alternatives. A patient with a known uh, keratoconus might come to your practice uh, 
for a condition that's called acute hydrops. This is a condition where we have a break in the decement membrane, that's the inner layer of the cornea, the inner glazing, as I tell the patients, they, I tell them the, the cornea is like a window, it has the outer glazing and the inner glazing. So we have a break in the decimate membrane that allows the aqueous to enter into the stroma, causing severe thickening, decreasing the vision, and pain. Usually, giving a cycloplegic agent and sodium chloride ointment or drops helps a lot. Sometimes you can put a patch or a contact lens. It helps quite a lot. Uh, and I've seen in a few cases, since scarring is created after um, the resolution of the hydrops, which can improve the vision in some cases because it changes the curvature and uh, it reduces the irregular astigmatism because actually what it does, it stiffens the cornea. But most of the cases then they have to end up with a penetrating keratoplasty because once you have this break in the decimate me membrane, you cannot do a partial thickness uh, graph, I'm afraid. Now, this is the final uh, thing I'm gonna talk about. Um, Fuchs endothelial uh, dystrophy, which um, I have a few patients that are referred to me uh, for this condition. It's a non-inflammatory sporadic autosomal dominant, I'll explain what that means, dystrophy that involves the inner layer of the cornea again. It's an inherited in an autosomal dominant manner. This means that affected individuals have at least 50% chance of passing the gene to the children. Um, it's uh, rarely seen in people younger than 30 to 40 years, and it seems to be high, uh, present slightly earlier in, in women. Practically, clinically, we, we have a loss of endothelial cells, and we have this creation of small acrescences in the decimates membrane that we call them guttata. When this happens, then we have fluid from the anterior chamber collects in the stroma, uh, of the corneal stroma, and increasing the thickness of the cornea, and causes reduced vision. Then this swelling collect, continues to go to the epithelial layers of the cornea that causes small blisters that we call them bulla. And these are very painful when they rupture. When we have chronic swelling, then fibrotic tissue is formed and causing permanent, permanent scarring. The um, early symptoms of uh, fuchs endothelial dystrophy, they, call, they are Contrast, reduced contrast sensitivity and mild reduction in visual acuity with glare and halos, especially at the nighttime driving. Um, once they start, the fluid starts to collect in the stroma, they start to notice these changes in the vision that they typically worsen in the morning and they improve in towards the end of the day. Eventually, eventually this fluctuation stops and they become, uh, the vision becomes constantly blurry. The pain uh, can be felt when they this have the formation of epithelial bulla and they rupture and they leave epithelial defects. The early treatment is usually with a form of um, uh, saline solution, hypertonic saline solution, sodium chloride 5%, drops or ointment, and blowing air in the eyes using a hair dryer <laughs> from this. Uh, from arm's length uh, uh, distance. Uh, actually, I had a few patients many years ago as a registrar when I was describing this, they were looking at like, what is he saying? But it's actually mentioned in all, uh, in, all in the literature that um, it did work in a few cases. And bandage contact lenses can be used, can be quite helpful in the management of a painful uh, rapt bulla. When, um, in the past, we did uh, full thickness uh, penetrating keratoplasty in order to deal with these um, uh, situations with uh, fuchs endothelial dystrophy. Nowadays, uh, we do either a decimate stripping endothelial keratoplasty when we have a thick, thin strip of donor posterior corneal stroma with the decimate membrane. And uh, also we have another method, it's called decimate membrane endothelial keratoplasty, DMEC, where we have only the decimate membrane um, without any corneal stroma uh, involved. And it has uh, much better results, I have to say, than the DSEC. Um, but the technique is a little bit more difficult, uh, but the visual outcomes by using DMEC uh, are very, very good. The point is, when we have these patients with endothelial um, dystrophy, 
have to say that only in a couple of patients that I've seen, they had um, corneal decompensation without having any cataract surgery. Most of them, um, when they came, they were completely asymptomatic and they were referred in the clinic because uh, they noticed uh, something on a routine appointment. And they were very, very um, correctly referred because in these cases, I prefer to do the cataract surgery earlier. Um, they might develop corneal decompensation after. That's the only risk from uh, having a fuchs endothelial dystrophy. But uh, actually, I prefer to do the cataract surgery in sooner in these conditions rather than later. But the, the good thing is when these patients come to, to the hospital, we discuss about the situation. They know what the problem is. They're more aware. So the threshold for cataract surgery in these patients is uh, it's lower than your average case. And that was it. I finished with the talk. I thought, I hope that it wasn't too many details, but uh, I'm afraid it's a big topic. Ian? Thank you very much indeed. Can you stop sharing your screen? And then I can come back on. That was, um, thank you so much. There's so much information. I've made so many notes. There's too, many, um, too much information, I know. No, that was really good. We have got, um, a question and I've got a question as well yeah but I'll read the question that's been uh, put to us first so how do you manage oh I've got a few questions coming in um how do you manage children with marginal character conjunctivitis where there's usually fibrovascular growth in the cornea and corneal scarring inferiorly okay so um these patients um have practically character conjunctivitis so um it can be inflammatory or it can be vernal keratoconjunctivitis. These cases, when uh, they come to us, uh, first we try to uh, relieve them from the symptoms. So we start with uh, um, intensive lubricating drops, steroid drops to count down the inflammation. And um, also we add some anti-allergic drops when there is vernal keratoconjunctivitis. After a short period, of course, of uh, intensive steroid and lubricating drops, um, then we consider long-term management. Long-term management is done with mild steroid drops like Softacort and also the use of uh, topical cyclosporin. For children, uh, the Ecurvis formulation is um, not licensed, but I've used it in children around the age of 11, 10. There is another formulation, it's called Vercasia, which is still cyclosporin and um, we use that as well. So practically, uh, cases like uh, you described, uh, they need um, strong anti-inflammatory drops uh, like cyclosporin. In the past, we, we didn't have this available, but from the moment that uh, it's widely available, uh, cyclosporin drops, we manage them in the beginning with steroid drops, lubricating drops, calm down the inflammation, sometimes also some anti-allergic drops, depending if it's vernal keratoconjunctivitis, all preservative-free, and then long-term management with um, uh, cyclosporin drops. And in cases, and when there is a flare-up, because it is possible to have a flare-up despite being on uh, strong anti-inflammatory drops, then we give a short course of steroids. I prefer to use uh, soft accord, which is a very mild steroid, and it, it doesn't cause... Um, uh, pressurize and uh, uh, cataract formation and things that go with other stronger steroids. Though, if it's not effective, I do use stronger steroids, but for a shorter period of time until they got a first relief of their symptoms. Mm -hmm. So the next question is, what would your preferred treatment for be for marginal keratitis, which I think is... Preferred treatment for marginal keratitis is a combination of topical antibiotic and um, steroid drop. Um, the commonest thing you can find in the practice is maxitrol. Then again, you can try a, a combination of preservative-free, like cornofemical preservative-free or uh, dexamethasone preservative-free. You can also try the mildest steroid, 0 0.5. Uh, prendizolone, preservative-free, I like preservative-free, and again, soft accord, but so, usually I don't, for marginal keratitis, I do prefer dexamethasone uh, rather than soft accord, which is a milder steroid, and I use it for uh, more inflammatory conditions, but for marginal keratitis, I do prefer combination of antibiotic 
and a, um, and a steroid. Uh, depending though, if the, this, the marginal keratitis, if it's a small one, I might use maxitrol, but if it's a bigger one uh, that involves uh, the stroma, I would use ofloxacin, for example, or levofloxacin, preservative free, and steroid. Thank you very much for that. Um, so you said you don't like baby shampoo to help with blepharitis. If patients feel that shop bought products are too expensive, would you be happy with bicarbonate of soda solution? Yes, that's another alternative actually. Um, this works quite well. I have actually have a few patients that they have been using it for ages and if they're fine with it, what I would advise is if you have a patient that already gets along with something, not to change it. Don't change their habit. If, if something works, there's not any need to change it. Uh, usually I tell them, give them a list of things to do, a, a phased list, because otherwise if you blast them with all these things, they're not gonna, you're not gonna be able to find out which one is working or not. So I usually tell them to start with the lubricating drops, plain lead hygiene, uh, then uh, use the lead wipes, use the eye bag or heat mask and see what works for them. Uh, but the, using baby shampoo and stuff, that was something that many years ago we were advising, but I found out that it can create allergies or irritations. Some people put a little bit more, less. There are already in commercially available solutions like wipes, the foam and stuff like that. You, you can use something that is safer, sterile, you don't have to use, I think, something that it's uh, you can do at home. Thank you. Are we to refer Fuchs endothelial dystrophy to you? Well, um, patients who are definitely patients who are not symptomatic or young patients around their 50s, they, I don't think so. But patients who are close also to them, like on the 60s, um, they starting to develop a little bit of opacity, uh, cataract practically, sorry, uh, then it would be worth because I, I, it's not that I'm gonna see them first time and I'm gonna list them for cataract, but we have a chat. I, I explain what the condition is. I explain what is the risk of the possible corneal decompensation. Definitely, I wouldn't like to do the cataract surgery to a patient that has a, a very dense cataract because I know 100% that they're gonna need an endothelial graft. Um, and many times when we do the surgery at an earlier stage, um, they don't develop um, corneal decompensation because they already they have a good cell count that allows them not develop this corneal decompensation. So definitely not 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 very youngish patients that they don't have any symptoms, but the ones that they start to develop a little bit of cataract, that's a good. At least we have it's a good. It's a good thing to have a chat so they're aware of, about the condition. And I actually, as I said, only a couple of patients I saw that they actually had corneal decompensation without having any cataract surgery. Only a couple of patients, though. Thank you very much. Is there a minimum cent corneal center thickness cutoff for cross linkage corneal? Cross -linkage? Usually, uh, usually around five. Uh, sorry, around four hundred microns. Uh, it's considered to be a thin cornea. But then um, in the past, they were not doing that many cross-linking or they were not doing cross-linking for these uh, thin corneas. But now you have a um, hypertonic um, um, riboflavin solution. So this, is, this can be done. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Around 400 is. Around 400. What are your thoughts on the use of steroid drops to reduce corneal scarring following central pupil foreign body removals? So yes, when there is not when the epithelial defect um, has um, when there is not any active epithelial defect or it's very very small, uh, you can use steroid steroid drops. Uh, but a short period of time, uh, what it does, it prevents uh, all the inflammatory factors because when you have a scarring, this is this is the cause. These are the the, the, um, the fibroblasts that create this scarring practically. So you stop this inflammatory reaction. You try to stop this inflammatory reaction that causes the scarring. So the answer is yes, but if it's central, definitely I try. I try to give steroids. I, I do. Try, I do give steroids if it's central. But if it's not involving the, the if if the um, uh, the foreign body and the, the scarring doesn't involve the visual axis, I wouldn't do that. Mm -hmm. 
but if it does, I do give a steroids, a short course of steroids, but under uh, observation, because you don't know if the patient is a steroid responder, you have to be careful. If I give the steroids, I tell them, uh, come back in two weeks time, let me check the pressure, then I can continue for another four to six weeks. Not longer, though. Not longer, not longer than four to six weeks. If, if there's not an improvement in four, six weeks or not further scarring, there's not any point to continue for a long period. Just make sure that, you know, that we don't have any problems with pressure. Thank you. Um, should we refer molluscum cases to you or just manage with over-the-counter AH drops? So what, um, I had a patient recently, a young patient, 20 something years old. Um, she had these corneal uh, lesions uh, uh, some tiny epithelial uh, infiltrates um, that uh, they started to appear after she had this small lesion on, on the lid. Uh, she thought it was like a chalazion or papilloma. Um, when I saw her, I, I saw that it wasn't the papilloma, so it looked like a molluscum contagiosum. But she had this lesion on the cornea, and it seemed also that it, it, it had involved also the stroma. And I was wondering, okay, that is a little bit odd. I gave her some uh, lubricating drops and mild steroid drops. Two weeks after, it was all clear. So what happened, she had molluscum contagiosum in that area there, on the, exactly on the lead margin, that this continuous release of virus practically created this inflammation, chronic inflammation, because for six months she had this red eye with blurry vision because the stroma was involved as well. Um, and then what we did, it would listen care for excision. So if it's something that it's on the cornea or, or affects the lid, the answer is yes, because we have to deal with it. And then again, remember, remember this is box virus, this is contagious and it can spread around. Mm -hmm. Lovely. Thank you very much. I'm talking about the lead. So when it's on the lead, when it when it's on the lead that involves the cornea as well. It's yeah. if it's on the lead itself, mm -hmm. might not. <laughs> Great. Thank you so much. That is all the questions that we've had presented. So I would like to say thank you very much for everybody to uh, for giving the questions. Thank you very much for Mr. Arnidis for his talk tonight and for the time he's put into that. I think that's been a, a fantastic talk. I will uh, upload the CET this weekend. Uh, the, the My CET website is down for uh, upgrades at the moment, so it'll be the weekend I'll put the CET on, and I'll aim to get the, uh, the video up on the YouTube channel this weekend as well. If you have any feedback for, from tonight's webinar for us, if you could uh, let us know on the, the WhatsApp group, and uh, any feedback is appreciated. Uh, the next webinar I am uh, arranging at the moment with the CET, um, with GOC, and I shall announce that hopefully in the next few days, uh, should be mid-February. We're trying to aim to do one a month, um, but I think there's one more question that, um, uh, oh, thank you very much for the great talk tonight. So thank you, appreciate that. Thanks uh, for standing and thanks for joining everybody. Yeah. I hope there's a, you can watch a movie or something else like now. <laughs> we can all have a glass of wine tonight. Thank you very, very much for that talk, and thank you everyone to watch for watching. And thank you uh, for invitation. stay safe and take care. And uh, we'll uh, announce the next webinar shortly uh, on the WhatsApp group. So thank you very much, and good night.